All right, so here we are. We are five phases down in the battle for Bharat. Two more phases to go. The national capital will be voting on Saturday. And then, if, of course, you have the last phase, which will happen on the 1st of June. Is 400 par for NDA and 370 for the BJP a done deal? Or is there some scope for a surprise for the India alliance? But more importantly, what is at stake in this election? If Mr. Modi were to win a third term, it will be the first time in the history of India since Jawaharlal Nehru that an incumbent prime minister is being voted back to office for a third term. What does this mean for India, particularly for young voters in India? And what is at stake in this election? Joining me now is one of the most articulate spokespersons of the government, somebody who is articulating Mr. Modi's view, certainly on foreign platforms and now increasingly on domestic platforms, the External Affairs Minister, Dr. Jay Shankar. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. So this is an interview where you're donning a politician's hat and less maybe a foreign minister's hat. You've been campaigning for your party across the length and breadth of this country. Would it be right to say that this whole campaign, this whole election is about Modi ki guarantee on the one side and the opposition is saying Congress ki guarantee or India Alliance ki guarantee on the other side. Why should the voters of India, particularly young voters, buy the Modi ki guarantee as opposed to what the Congress or the India Alliance is offering? Uh, first of all, good to be with you, Zaka. And uh, I think, uh, you know, if one travels across this country during election time, there's a lot you learn, a lot you pick up. Uh, often the perspectives are very different from what they look uh, from Delhi. Uh, and some of that, at least, I'd like to share with you. Is this election about Modi ki guarantee? Absolutely. Uh, because, in a way, uh, you have Prime Minister Modi, two terms, 10 years, solid track record. So the credibility of the guarantee derives from the credibility of the track record. Equally, where other people's guarantee, because there's not a single guarantee out there. There's a gaggle of people out there, each one of them. In fact, very often they pull in very different directions. About the only guarantee that they can suggest is, look, you, if you try, if you get, you know, somewhere support us, we are not, we are different. I mean, there's nothing beyond that which actually unites them. So, I would say the, the issue before the country is, based on the track record, based on the aspirations. Because one is the 10-year track record. The other is what we are also putting to the country. The goal of Vixit Bharat, next 25 years, it's only a Modi government which can get us moving uh, in that direction. Okay. So I think the choices are pretty clear. The choices are a 10-year track record and a 25-year journey and an optimizing, optimist, uh, optimistic, confident vision of India. You know, I think what the other side is offering is frankly a very poor track record, many track records in fact, of uh, varying of, yeah. quality, most of it uh, uh, not so good. Mm. Uh, and uh, also I would say uh, in a way they don't have a vision. Okay. They actually are evoking fears. They are evoking, you know, if you do this, this will change, that will change. Uh, so I, I think it's a, it's a vote both for the achievements as well as for the aspirations. So tell me about this vision that you're saying, Vixit Bharat, in the next 25 years, 2047. What is in it for a young voter? If, you, if a young voter in Delhi or Mumbai, or, or Mumbai is of course voted, but in Delhi or in Chandigarh is watching this program, what is in it for them for the next 25 years? I, I don't think, uh, Zaka, it's only in the big cities. Okay. I think it's across the board for all young voters. Okay. And for the young voters, number one, they will remember, see, someone who's, let us say, 21, mm -hmm. they will need to think what has changed in the last 10 years or the last five years in their life. And I think they would give a lot of credit there to Prime Minister personally and to his government. So there's the... Pre in a sense, you can say the past. Then there is the present. Mm. There are a host of challenges, opportunities. Who is best geared to take them forward? So clock starts ticking June 4th. June 4th, you're off the block. Who's ready to lead? 
who has a, a, a pathway, who has a plan, you know, who has the experience, the credibility of delivery. And then there is the future, because we are talking of people today who would be below 30. Yeah. In their lifetime, in their working lifetime, they will realize what it means to be Vixit Bharat. Mm -hmm. You know, they will see this country go to become a 30, 35, 40 trillion dollar economy. Okay. Okay. And so, and to them also the opportunities which may not be readily understandable to someone much older. Mm -hmm. You know, there are new industries coming up there. The AI will be both a disruptor and a creator. Uh, you have this whole semiconductor, the chips issue. Electric mobility, you know, is going to not just change the way we drive our cars. Mm. It's actually going to create a new industry in itself. You know, we're going to produce electricity differently, consume electricity differently. Mm. You know, the Modi government's idea that every house will have a rooftop solar. Correct. Think of the implications of it. Think of the jobs coming out of it, or the benefits to the individual household. So I think for the young voter, the, my message would be, look at the track record. Look who's ready to uh, move as soon as elections are, are done. Who's, who's, who do you trust? Mm. Who do you think is most capable of understanding your aspirations? And three, who has a vision of the future? Mm. And then let me add one thing as a foreign minister. You know, the world's a mess. The world's going to be a bigger mess. Now, because look, you're seeing multiple conflicts, tensions, you name it, it's yeah. there. If in this stormy sea, whose hand do you trust on the tiller of the ship that is India to navigate us through this? If you are, you know, I, I give you a very interesting example from my experience, it's happened to me a few times okay. in Orissa, in Maharashtra, in Rajasthan. Families have come to me to say thank you for what we did for them, for their, for the person concerned or for mm. family member in Ukraine. I ask people, imagine if a crisis like Ukraine happens again, mm. which probably will, given yeah, what's happened. Yeah. So tell me. Your son, daughter, niece, nephew, brother, sister is stuck there. Who would you trust leading the country, making those judgments? Who will bring back your kid? Do you look at, look at those people on the other, other side? Do you have that confidence in them? Mm. And they said? I think <laughs> you know the answer. Okay, but I want to talk a little bit about this young voter because the other side is saying it's exactly this same young voter who is most, you know, uh, uh, concerned with the Modi government or who's most affected by the Modi government because Rahul Gandhi says unemployment is at a record high. That's the number one issue of this election. How do you counter that? Well, I'm not sure how much Rahul Gandhi knows about the employment market. He's never had to look for a job. Uh, but put that aside. Tell me one thing. You know, you know the numbers which are generally agreed upon. You know that uh, in the last 10 years, the number of people paying tax has more than doubled. You know the big spike in Provident Fund subscribers. You know that 46 crore people took our beneficiaries of Mudra loan. Okay, You know, there is this 7% growth, but there is this unlike jobless growth of the old days. Today you are seeing all that construction, you know, 28 kilometers of highway, 14 kilometers of railway, the, you know, the uh, buildings. All of this is going on. Are these not uh, jobs which are m making this happen? I mean, so... I think this whole idea that, you know, unemployment, see, this is like, first you say unemployment is high, then you say everybody is saying unemployment is high, therefore it must be high. 
you know, look, look actually at the, at the reality. Definitely, I would say people, especially young people, want better jobs. Okay. That's a legitimate aspiration. Okay. But to do that, what do you have to do? You have to create manufacturing yeah. jobs. Now, guess what? Who opposes manufacturing in this country? Leading the list is Mr. Rahul Gandhi, who actually has been making fun of Make in India. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the UPA tenure, by the kind of uh, hostility towards uh, business, towards job creation, using environment to stifle growth. Mm. Even today, saying that, you know, we cannot compete with China, we can never, you know, we, this yeah. is a lost cause. So, A, you are exaggerating the employment uh, challenge. Yeah. B, you are actually doing everything which you have a track record of doing of actually preventing job creation in this country. Three, the numbers tell you a very different story. You know, ask people out there in the market, if, if, the, if actually unemployment was so high, why are wages going up in this country, please tell me. I mean, don't, don't believe me. Look at rural wages in this country, look at urban wages in this country, both are going up. You know, at the end of the day, wages have a story to tell also. Yeah. So let me come to this election. Now, when this election started in March, in April, you know, from the Prime Minister downwards, uh, your party was saying Char So Far and Mission 370 and so on and so forth. But now, none of y'all are saying that. So the opposition no, is saying... that's say not true. That's not true, but finish. Yeah, the opposition yeah. is saying that this is a sign that you're nowhere close to Teen So Sattar or Char So Far, meaning that what this election was, a cakewalk or considered to be a cakewalk eight weeks ago, that's not the case anymore. The BJP is actually feeling the heat. This is their contention. See, no, no election is a cakewalk. And nobody, believe me, as a person uh, who is uh, participating as a politician in a first general election, I've done state assembly elections. It's very, very hard work. Mm. Okay. Nothing can be taken for granted, nor should it be. I mean, okay. in my view, in democracy, people have the right. After all, what is this cycle about? This is the time for people to ask you the hard questions, for you to answer, to be put through a grind, to have your record examined. I think that's completely legitimate and that is what we see happening out there. Sure. Uh, when the idea of 370 for BJP and Char So Par for NDA was done, a lot of thought was went into it. It was not a figure plucked out of the uh, thin air. Thin air. Uh, my sense is you have had all sorts of mind games going on round after round, you know. Uh, oh, the voter numbers are different. It's very hot, you know. Uh, who knows where this is going. Mm. Okay, these are political tactics. Okay, I'm also getting it. Okay. But I can tell you there's a lot of confidence. I mean, we're all plugged into, you know, the, the BJP uh, yeah. system. We have a lot of confidence that we're going to make very, very show sure, very solid performance. That, three seven, that 370 and that 400 is very much in people's mind. And come June 4th, you'll We'll see the answer. But, but let, 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 let me ask you this, because you've been traveling across, you know, the length and breadth during this particular election more so. You've been to Chennai, Bangalore, Mumbai, all across the country. Where is this extra 70 seats going to come from? Look, uh, I, can, I'm, I cannot answer yes. a, a empirically mm. for the whole lot. Anecdotally, I can tell you a bit. Let me talk about the states I've been. Mm. Okay. Definitely, I went to Kerala. Yeah. I could see an enthusiasm, and I've been going to Kerala for four or five years now. Mm. Okay. I saw a degree of enthusiasm and kind of energy out there, which I've not seen before. I think we have a strong confidence we'll pick up seats there. Tamil Nadu, I hear from others, but I hear very similarly positive things. I myself went to Telangana. Yeah. Okay, you know, Telangana was like a, a like a avalanche, you know, 
I mean, there was a, such an outpouring uh, mm -hmm. of support. I was in Odisha, you know, where a lot of people both see the, uh, evaluate positively the record of Modi government, but they also see BJP as the party of change. Okay. You know. Now, I was in Calcutta, you know, okay, I grant you Calcutta is not the entirety of Bengal, Bengal yeah. but it gives you a, a sense, you know. I think there's a lot of confidence will pick up seats uh, in Bengal. I think if you look at these, look at Andhra, you know, the census NDA as a whole is going to do very, very well in Andhra. There's a lot of confidence that will pick up more seats in UP. Mm. So believe me, those numbers will come, you know, those, those uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, as I said, those numbers were not concocted out of nothing. I think there was a calculation at play. Uh, there is a target to which people are working. Uh, that target has been broken down into states and ultimately into constituencies. Yeah. So people in our system, we know or we have a sense of exactly which are the ones where we really have to put in all that effort. So, uh, one theme in this election, both from the BJP side as well as from the uh, India Alliance side, has been about reservation and, you know, quotas and so on. The India Alliance has been going on and on about why does the Modi government need Char So Par? The moment they get Char So Par, they will amend reservations, they will take away reservations from Dalits, etc. To which the Prime Minister and other leaders in your party have been responding by saying it's actually the India Alliance that wants to do this. They want and to take. Have done it. Yeah. Which have done it in universities. You know, they have taken minority universities and removed reservations. Jamia Islamia being yeah, right. one instance. But, but on a broader this thing, the examples of Andhra Pradesh, uh, the examples of Karnataka being given, that they will take away quota from OBC and give it to Muslims. Now, the opposition is saying, again, Mr. Modi's government is resorting back to its one calling card of Hindu-Muslim because he's not confident about this election. That's why this whole business about quotas. Uh, let me make a set of points here. Number one, why does the con uh, the why does the opposition particularly congress party talk about changing the constitution because they have done it most of all you know uh, 80 odd amendments have been done by them okay whenever they had numbers and you we saw how they behave during emergency so in a sense they think that because they behave in a certain way other people will behave in that way Sorry, we are not them. First issue. Second issue, you are asked me uh, reservations. Look, the BJP is very, very clear. The BJP is committed to the reservation, the, the, the practice and tradition of reservations that we've had. And a lot of it derives from the constitution. Okay. Who are the people who have tried to change it? Who has taken away from OBC? Who has brought in religion? faith as a criteria of reservation, not the BJP, it is the Congress party. They have attempted it, the courts have struck it down, they are still trying it in Karnataka. They have, we are, I mean, you yourself mentioned an institution where they have used the minority argument to actually do away with the reservation argument. So anybody has threatened reservation, you can see, the record bears it out. Now, if you are going to actually use, you know, advocate faith-based reservation. I am entitled to contest that and challenge. Of course. That's not being communal. In fact, I will tell you what is being communal. Attacking Sanatan Dharma, which is what we saw DMK doing and everybody else going along with it. That is being communal. Attacking Ramakrishna mission is being communal. So, look, it's like, I mean, let's be straight here is attacking the majority religion of this country not being communal? Do, do, you know, because it is a majority religion, others are supposed to get a free pass? I, I think I have every right to contest that. So, we are, you know, to expect us to be silent, because in this, in this uh, uh, election, we have heard from, especially from Congress, two very important ideas and the country needs to reflect on it. Idea number one, that 
you should have faith based reservation which obviously will be at the expense of currently existing reservation and they have a track record to show they mean it. Number two, they actually want to do this, I will assess assets across the country and I as the state will have the right to redistribute it. Now, this is going back to pre-92. Yeah. You know, this is Avadi resolution 1955, Nehru, distal Nehru leftism, which ruined the country, brought us to the sorry pass of 91-92. So, what you have, I mean, I must say, to, in fairness to Rahul Gandhi, he is offering a clear vision. He is offering a vision of faith-based reservation. He is offering a vision of leftist redistribution of the socialist policies which destroyed this country, which killed job creation in this country versus the vision we are offering. And I think in politics, it is fair to debate it. Uh, we put our points across uh, vigorously. I think people are entitled to hear our point of view. So, let me come to the other issue and since we are talking just before Delhi votes, uh, the big talking point here is the Chief Minister, the fact that he was arrested, now he has been uh, given bail to campaign. He says, uh, jail ka jawab vote se. And this is a consistent theme, other parties in the opposition have also been saying that you use agencies like ED, IT, CBI disproportionately against the opposition and that democracy is under threat, that opposition is under threat. So, let me, let me make two points here. I think a lot of this Prime Minister himself has answered. But uh, Zaka, there is also a fact. Let us look at this particular case. What is this whole thing about? This is about the liquor, liquor, gate, yeah. liquor gate. When did liquor gate start? did not start now. Been going on for some time. Yeah. When did people start getting arrested for liquor gate? Not now. Been going on for some time. Who dragged it out? The gentleman concerned. So, I mean, there was no intent on the part of the central government to time any of this. And can it be, I mean, can you take a view to let democracy flourish, please overlook a scandal like liquor gate? I mean, is, is the law to be held in suspension for some people because they happen to be standing for election? In this case, they are not even standing for yeah, election. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they are just yeah. they are just campaigning. So, look, at the end of the day, so, I mean, the law is the law. I mean, you cannot press the pause button on law. And if the case had no validity, then the courts would have acted differently. Yeah. What have the courts done? Okay? The courts in many cases, I mean, let us let's assume these are political cases. Then the courts would have said, okay, there is not enough evidence, uh, we are giving the person bail and we will see later on. But the courts are not doing that. In many cases, bail has been denied. Even in the case of this gentleman, he has been told up to this date, okay, you have a, to allow you to campaign, campaign yeah. we are giving you a, which means the court themselves are not convinced that prima facie there is no case. On the contrary, they seem to think prima facie there is a case. No, but, but the, the larger point that the opposition is making is A, this use of agencies disproportionately. And two, that it's not a level playing field. This election, you've frozen their finances, BJP gets all the money, all the electoral bonds, and then it's a non-level playing field in this election. No, look, it's like this. Uh, if you look at any of these criteria that you use, uh, in fact, even if you look at, at the uh, electoral bonds, hmm. I think numbers have been put out there. Yeah. Yes, the BJP gets the most money, the BJP happens to be the biggest party. Now, uh, surely it cannot be that the smallest party will get the biggest money and the biggest party will get the small. There will be some correlation between the, yeah. the volume of the bonds and the size of the party. But if you take the totality of the opposition, please see, I mean, uh, I'll, in fact, I will put the opposite question. If you all had problems with the election bonds, why did you go and then accept that money? Because all of them have accepted it. Congress party has accepted it. Yeah. TMC has accepted it. DMK has accepted it. DMK, yes. So, let me come to another issue. And this again, you know, time and time again, and especially on TV debates and studios, you've heard this a lot in the last five phases, is that the voter turnout has been depressed. That the voter turnout, the BJP voter is not coming out. If there is great enthusiasm, as you say, for Mr. Modi to get a third term, 
why is there depressed voter turnout? And the opposition is saying this is evidence that Mr. Modi is on shaky ground. So, uh, let's, let's look at the proposition because there is the, uh, you know, these are, these are those little clever games which, which are being played. So, what's the difference between previous elections and this elections? In the first round, uh, between 2019 turnout in the same state and this, about 3%? Two, yeah, 3%. 2%? Yeah. Compared to 2014, about the same? Yeah. Hmm? Uh, would you say, you know, it narrowed further in second round? It narrowed further in third round? Yeah. Fourth round on par? More or less the same. Fifth yeah. round in some places increase? Hmm. Okay. Now, first of all, this this canard that there's some big change out there. The numbers don't bear it out. I mean, a 1%, 2% change happens in election. Okay? Number one. Number two, what makes anybody think that it's the BJP's voters who haven't turned out? How do you know that? On the contrary, you know, we are the people, you know, we are a cadre based party, we have committed votes. We're not looking, I mean, we're looking quite comfortable and, and confident. I mean, your feedback is your voters have come out. Yes. Okay. So, we're, we're not... Uh, first of all, we think this voters' number is vastly exaggerated. Hmm. Number two, I mean, and it's, it has multiple reasons. Yeah. You know. Number two, we have no reason to believe our voters stayed back. Stayed home. Okay. Number three, see, what happens? What is, the, if you ask me today, what is the mood today? I think in much of the country, there's a pro-incumbency mood. If I am happy, see, if I am angry with you, Zaka, I will express it very forcefully. Sure. If I am happy with you, I'll be nice to you, right? Yeah. I'm not going to be like over the top being nice to you. Because I've already, you know, I'm going to express my appreciation when I vote. Hmm. I'll press the right button. So I, I think this idea that, uh, you know, uh, uh, look, this time there is less passion, etc. All this, these are all political, uh, political games at play because the numbers just don't bear them out. So let's talk a little bit more about some of these political games and you have referred to this and some of this is in the foreign policy domain. Uh, the Western media and some of the coverage of the Western media around our elections. Now, you were in Kolkata, I think, last week and you said that uh, countries which have to go to court for deciding election results are giving gyan on conducting uh, polls. You also earlier said that some of these folks are trying to become active players in our election. Now, my point is that if India is conducting this election, there are 90 plus crore voters who are voting. Uh, some of these folks seem to have discounted that fact. Uh, what do you say to them? The sections of the press that you are saying is biased, whether it is the Guardian report which says, oh, Modi is constructing highways, but where are the jobs? Or the New York Times report which says, uh, uh, you know, India's Muslims in Modi's India and so on and so forth. What do you say to them? You have 90 crore people who are going out and exercising their franchise. Uh, it, there seems to be a disconnect between the two. Well, uh, two things. Uh, to them, I think the real answer would be given by those 90 crore people on the 4th of June. Okay. I'm waiting for that. Number two, the uh, the interim answer which I am giving is look, I know what you guys are doing, mm -hmm. or you, what you guys are trying to, trying do, to do, what what you think you can do. You think still that this is the old era where you set the tonality and the argumentation. Then your uh, fellow travelers pick it up within the country. Then, you know, the public gets influenced by the way the narrative goes. Now, guess what? It doesn't work like that anymore. Number one, yes, there are segments of my politics and segments of my media which are very attached to you and which, and you have an eco uh, chamber arrangement out here. Recognize that. But a large part of my uh, system today is thankfully autonomous of you. That it generates its own narratives, 
it, it has its own views, it pushes back on many of those things and often what you think is my negative, they actually think is my positive. So you might try and skewer me somewhere, they are actually clapping their hands and say, oh great job. So I, I think people out there are missing some things, I, frankly in many ways I think they don't have an understanding of what are the changes uh, in India. So uh, I, I feel in a way we are seeing like a, I don't want to say last gasp because there will be more, uh, but certainly a kind of a flailing effort, flailing effort by an old business which is overvalues its influence uh, and which honestly in this country has become increasingly irrelevant. They still have their friends. The friends are counting on them. I know that. That's why friends keep appealing to them and cite them. But it's not going to happen. Let's talk about one of these friends and uh, you, must, you must have followed these comments, Ian Bremmer of the Eurasia Group. Uh, he made a comment recently saying that there's nothing inevitable about India's rise and that uh, India should not take its rise for granted. Do you see this again as part of the same, as you said, you know, friends and friends no, of friends. No, no. no yeah, it's look, a different thing. Okay. One, I know Ian for a long time. Mm -hmm. Ian doesn't get into uh, setting political narratives, at least in respect of India. Okay. You know, what he does elsewhere, I don't want to go into. <laughs> uh, so, I think at this point that a country, in our case us, should not take its rise for granted, I agree with. In fact, that is why I tell young people, it's your next 25 years at stake. Don't think it's going to happen on autopilot. Press the right button. Make sure this 10 years of achievement is followed up by more and more. Go for that continuity, for that stability, for that good judgment, for that experience. Go for someone who understands technology, someone who understands geopolitics. You know, someone who doesn't think, you know, uh, doesn't mouth cliches and cannot sustain their arguments. Go for someone who can analyze the world uh, powers situation, can take calls, can take stands, can defend our border, can take action against terrorism, can look at big power competition and say this is India's interest and that's what we're going to do. That is what will make it not inevitable but probable and possible. So I, I actually accept, you know, I, I think the rise of India is predicated on Indian people naturally, you know, doing all the hard work, but at the end of it all, also on their choices. That is why this election is so important. So Rahul Gandhi says development will happen khatakat, 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 almost suggesting that it will be on autopilot. It's despite government. Well, I think the statement which you uh, referred to says a lot about his understanding and his gravitas, right? I mean, if things happen khatakat, khatakat in the previous years, why did we have that kind of growth rates, poor growth rates, uh, you know, when uh, his family members were prime ministers of this country? You know, why is it that today, you know, a lot of the development we are to doing today, what are we doing? We are playing catch up. We are playing catch up for long periods of neglect. So, you see, the khata khat itself shows you I mean, the lack of understanding. I mean, he actually thinks these are all cliches and, you know, remarks which will take form on their own because there is no experience of that. I mean, look, to lead this country, you cannot have a job resume that is a blank sheet and say, I want to leave this, read this country. You have got to have done things in this country to lead this country. You are saying Rahul Gandhi's job resume is a blank sheet. I want to come back to again one more foreign policy issue because again your party leaders, various leaders have been referring to this about, you know, uh, claiming POK and that it will uh, uh, become part of India very soon if BJP is voted to power. Today, I think the Prime Minister has given an interview where he has said, ki main to visa, bina visa ke chala gaya Pakistan because uh, Ek mein to desh ka hissa hi tha. No, is this no, some no, kind no, of an... That's not quite what he said. He said, main Lahore, gaya, whatever. And he said, Waha koi TV interviewer yeah, yeah. Ke tha. 
Yeah. So let's not put words in his mouth. Yeah. No, I'm saying, is this yeah. some kind of an unfinished agenda for your government? I think the uh, the POK is a long-standing uh, that PO, that India's writ should run on POK, which is part of our country, is a long-standing position uh, of the uh, people and government of India and the parliament of India. Mm. The problem is, like you are, people have cheated on the constitution, like they have played games on so many other issues, they make it out as though, uh, you know, that doesn't exist and this is something which is a sort of uh, angularity uh, of the of the BJP. BJP is reflecting and articulating what is the sentiment of every right-thinking Indian citizen. Which one of us does not believe that POK is part of India? And if it is part of us, do we not have a uh, obligation and a uh, and a sentiment uh, and thinking about it. It's not true. But the issue has come up because, see, nobody wanted to talk about POK because they didn't want to talk about Kashmir. Hmm. They didn't want to talk about Kashmir because everybody had a cozy arrangement in Kashmir. That, that cozy arrangement was draining the exchequer here and bleeding Kashmir there. That was really what was happening. Now, once you got out of that cozy arrangement, and in a sense integrated and normalized Kashmir and you are seeing the results today. This is now, after the abrogation. After the abrogation. Now once you see that you know, Kashmir take off, the valley take off, the POK people are naturally making those comparisons. So, I mean, I put it to you logically that Kashmir itself is an issue where an enormous effort has been made over multiple years to lead this country down the wrong path because there were, frankly, votes to be had, or so people thought. There were, you know, po there was very narrow political interests involved. And as I said, who gained from what cozy arrangements? I think we are already beginning to see. I, I do want to get one, one final word from you about the tragic passing away recently of the uh, Iranian president, Ibrahim Raisi. You were there at the Iranian embassy a few days ago. The vice president was there for his uh, funeral. Uh, do you see any bearing of the passing away of the president on India-Iran ties, particularly in the context of Chabahar, which you recently uh, renewed? Look, uh, uh, he was a person who had a very positive view of the relationship, took a lot of interest in it. Uh, and uh, uh, in that sense, uh, certainly his contributions were very noteworthy. I would also say of the foreign minister, you know, He's a person I had known for some time uh, before he became foreign minister. Uh, and I had uh, uh, talked to him recently, I mean, just a few weeks ago, uh, when tensions were high uh, out there, and uh, uh, always found him a person with whom one could talk to regularly. But uh, I feel today, our, uh, you know, there's a certain structural strength to that relationship. Uh, uh, so. Uh, we have a, you know, strong convergence in uh, many uh, areas. So I think the fundamentals are very, very strong, very strong, uh, and I expect that to really be the force of continuity uh, in the relationship. And, and finally, this election obviously is being closely followed across the world. It's being followed in New York, in London, in Beijing. What does this election mean from a from a global sort of perspective? I think it means a lot. It means a lot because Zaka, if you look at contemporary electoral politics in democratic societies, very, very, very few people would have been elected back to back three times. And if, uh, you know, there are people who actually say our numbers, the, our vote share will also go up. Hmm. very visibly. When, when the rest of the world sees that, you know, the look, the world is very clinical, very, uh, you know, objective, almost cold-blooded yeah. in its assessments. When they see a leader re-elected 
into a third term. If they see that you know his support in the country has gone up, when they see the achievements of previous tenure, when they see the kind of uh, I would say ambition and the motivation today in the country to progress, I think all of these will be factors in a very uh, dynamic, very troubled, very volatile uh, right. geopolitics of the day. So I expect actually, I mean my own sense is uh, there are our own, own investors uh, who, will, who are waiting for June 4th. But I think the world is also waiting for June 4th. I mean I myself know in many cases uh, uh, companies who have said, look, let's, let's just wait out the election. But many of them are ready to go today with their India plans. So it could be economic, it could be investment, it would be trade, it will be that desire to partner us. Uh, so the Bharat stock will go up on June 4th in the world's markets. That is really what is going to happen. And then, you know, we ha it's up to us to use it really to accelerate uh, our rise. And I think that is why, again, I come back to where we began. Mm -hmm. That is why it's important for young voters to go there and make their choice and press the button. So, and I, I have every confidence in their judgment. I don't even need to tell them which button to press. In my heart of hearts, I know what they will press. And that is why, you know, we today are making that effort today to, uh, to reach out to them and remind them that this is the most basic obligation, uh, most basic duty that they have to the welfare of their country. So, 4 June ko 4 so par. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. External Affairs Minister Dr. Jayashankar, thank you very much for speaking with us here on CNN News 18. Thank you.